Uh, um, so how much is that? Welcome to the podcast, Editors Mastermind. I am Carrie Caulfield Eric, and I am here with Daniel Abendroth, Brian Ensminger, Tanner Campbell. <laughs> I was waiting for Jennifer. <laughs> I forgot how many people were here. Yeah. <laughs> so Jennifer Longworth is doing the producing part today. So thank you for that very much, Jennifer. And yes, we are here with Tanner Campbell of the Portland Pod. And we're having Tanner on because he wrote a very interesting article on Medium called Accountability as a Service. And he was discussing the future of podcast editing. So, Tanner, we're going to get to that in a sec. So, but why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself in case they don't know you or haven't seen you around in the Podcast Editors Club? Boy, um, <laughs> I'm a Gemini. <laughs> I, I was thinking, did she just give you the please tell me about yourself thing? <laughs> I did. I totally did. I was like a gotcha question. right on the bed. Short it's walks terrible. on the beach. I don't like walking much. No, I'm just kidding. I started editing podcasts uh, professionally in 2015, and I started my first podcast in 2010. So I've been in or around the medium for, I guess, 10 going on 11 years now, which is a little wild. It was kind of organic the way that I started doing this for money. I had a podcast called The Legends, Myths, and Whiskey Podcast, which as I did it, I incorporated a lot of things that most podcasters don't tend to incorporate, uh, only because I seem to be addicted to spending money when I shouldn't be spending money. Uh, so one of the things that we did was hire a composer to write some original music for the stories that we would tell on that podcast. And that got us a little bit of attention and it got some people reaching out to me saying, Hey, you know, your podcast sounds really good, which is probably in large part to Nico Vertese, who is our composer still to this day. Would you mind maybe editing our podcast? Cause, cause yours sounds really good. And at this point, even though I'd been podcasting since 2010 and had had a successful show prior to legends, Miss and whiskey, I still had a lot of that imposter syndrome thing going on, right? I didn't really feel like I was good enough to be charging anybody for anything. I mean, I was using Pro Tools. I was, I definitely had a, a tool set, but I still felt like I really didn't know what I was doing in large part, especially to be charging somebody. So I said, oh, well, <laughs> sure, I'll do it. Maybe I'll, <laughs> I'm almost, I'm embarrassed to say this because it's terrible and no one should ever do this. I think I did it for $30 an episode. I said, you know what? If, if it sucks, just don't tell anybody, and I'm happy to do it. But if it's not any good, no hard feelings. I don't have to keep keep editing it. I won't even charge you, in fact, if you don't like it. Like I was very nervous to do this for money. And those clients just stayed on with me year after year, and slowly $30 an episode became like $75 an episode and 100 or so dollars an episode. And f fast forward a couple of years, and I'm living in Maine. All this happened in Florida. Uh, and... I make a jump from my full-time job, which was, uh, I was in IT. I was a director of IT at the United Way of Greater Portland, manager of IT at United Way of Greater Portland. And I wasn't really satisfied in the role and I wasn't really satisfied in that career anymore. I had done it for quite some time and I just wasn't happy with it. And a friend of mine, while we were walking out of the office one day, pointed at an empty, uh, you know those little spaces where you'll put an ATM? It'll be next to the entryway or the breezeway of a bigger building, and you need your card to get into it. Mm. So it's isolated from the rest of the, the, the building. Anyway, one of those was empty and didn't have an ATM in it. And he said, you know, that would make a good podcasting studio because I still had these clients, and I was still trying to you know, keep my skills you know, sharp. I was getting better. I, I was a lot better at that point. This was like 2018. And I said, be quiet, Ken. I actually said, shut up, Ken. You, you don't know what you're talking about. That wouldn't work. It's, it's all glass, for goodness sake. What would I do? And then I got home and I was like, uh, I mean, I'm only editing. And my girlfriend is getting pretty upset that I have all this stuff in the house. I'm taking over half of our very small <laughs> apartment with like foam on the walls. And I'm very particular about where things are. And she probably thinks I'm insane. Uh, so... 
I mean, I'm just editing. It's not like I'm going to have anybody in there. So sure, I could do that. So I called up the fellow who was in charge of renting spaces in that particular building. And I said, hey, I've got a crazy idea. Could I talk to the name of the guy who owns the uh, the building? And he said, sure, I'll see if he's available. And so a day goes by and that individual gets back to me and says, so I heard from so-and-so, you have an idea. And I said, I said, yeah, it's a little crazy. And he says, I like crazy ideas. Why don't you tell me what it is? And I said, well, I, I want to put a little podcasting studio in you know, that little empty ATM space that you have down there. And he said, that's a crazy idea. And I said, yeah. He goes, let's do it. So he said, not only let's do it, I will give you that place for eight months with no rent whatsoever under the condition that if things work out, because this is a 60 square foot box, right? Like this is nothing. He's not making any money by, by renting it out to an ATM anyway, not significant money. I'll let you have it for free for eight months. And if in eight months things are not working out for you, you got to get out. No, you know, no hard feelings, but you got to move on and we'll put an ATM in there. Uh, and if things do work out, well, then we'll talk about what you could rent that small space for. One condition, the people who take up most of this building, which was uh, Camden National Bank and then floors two, three, four, and five had uh, attorneys in it. I have to check with them to make sure that they're okay with having you in the front of their building because potentially you might tarnish their image if if you, you know, <laughs> do outlandish things in your glass box. And so we went back and forth for a couple of months and I had to mock up a 3D illustration in Google SketchUp of what this place would look like. And it was just a lot of back and forth. And eventually it came back as a no. Um, however, because I'm not a all your eggs in one basket kind of guy. I was looking for a place to edit if that didn't work out. Because even though he was really open to it, it, it did still feel like a long shot, like way, way too lucky for something like that to just fall into my lap. And so I found a co-working space, which is where my studio still is today. Uh, and I rented a desk and started editing there in the meantime. And then that kind of expanded into about a 200 square foot room that was split between a talent side and an engineering side. And then I want to say in November, we expanded to include a second engineering suite and a second talent suite, which is what I'm sitting in now, what we call Studio B. And a lot happened between then, and I'm I'm breezing over a lot, but that's that's pretty much the story. <laughs> I don't mean to be like speechless, but... But there's a lot there, right? <laughs> that, you're right. There's a lot to unpack. Um, so you now, your, your business, the... Uh, Portland Pod, you do a white glove service for mostly businesses, companies. Where was that shift between kind of doing it for maybe, because it sounds like maybe you started like most of us with like, you know, maybe individual creators, because I could be wrong. No, you're absolutely right. That's, that's exactly where we started. So those, those first few clients that I mentioned in the story, they were very, they were key to me being able to go from a a desk here at the co-working space to having my own suite to start the Portland pod. I approached five, there were five of them, three of them uh, stayed on with me and bit on this offer. And I said, look, I think I was charging them like $400 a month to do an episode a week, right? They were very low maintenance. They were single host shows. They were, they were easy. And I went to them and I said, look, already knowing that I was giving them a good price. If you pay for a year up front, I'll give you a 50% discount off that year, which is, again, don't do that. <laughs> don't, don't do that. Uh, but, no. bec but because of what I was trying to accomplish in that I had, I mean, I'm a, I'm a 37 year old guy, 35 year old guy at the time. I'm co I'm co-signed on, on family members, student loans. I've got a car loan. Like I don't have the kind of credit to go to a bank and say, I've got a crazy idea. I'm going to open up the first podcasting studio in friggin' New England. And you're going to give me a hundred grand to do it. Like that just wasn't going to happen. So I went to them and I said, you know, if you could do this, I'll give you this deal. Three of them bought in. So it ended up being something, it was a few thousand dollars that I used to, in a very crude way, outfit what we now call Studio A and, and get started. In those first few months, which really started September 2018, all the, we didn't formally incorporate until February of 2019, uh, but we were working in 2018. and. In the first, let's say, five months from September to whatever five months from then is, we realized 
I realized, the royal we realized that by the time I needed help, I wasn't going to be able to afford to buy it. So I couldn't scale. And that forced me to take a really honest look at it's not about what I feel like I should make. It's about what I need to make if by the time I get client number, whatever that is, because that's as many as I can handle in a week as, a, as an individual who's also running a business, how much do I need to charge per client in order to be able to afford to hire someone so that every engineer, and this is, this is the model we work on now, every engineer has a set number of clients before we hire another engineer, and then they get a set number of clients. And for each time we do that, uh, the profit margins of the business increase. So the reason that we switched to business is because there was no way, <laughs> there was no way we could hit that number and scale this business into, we did 98,000 our first year. It was just me. And then this year we were set up for like 330,000, but then got hit really hard by the COVID thing as did, as did almost every single business that is small like mine. But we realized that if we didn't shift to serving businesses, the people who had the money, I mean, we couldn't charge, you know, John Smith down the street, $640 for a podcast episode. They were never going to be able to pay that. And they wouldn't have paid 390 which is just our editing rate per episode. They could never afford that, which meant that if I persisted in serving independent creatives, I would never escape being trapped by the business I'd created. I, I would never have an exit strategy. I would never be able to grow. I could never hire anybody else, provide benefits to anybody else, provide benefits even to myself. And so the change happened because I wanted to be more than just me editing for a static number of clients and dealing with that churn and never really moving beyond making, you know, $200 an episode. And, and I couldn't even charge that much, really, especially a main. So we made the switch and we were really fortunate. We had somebody walk into our studio almost uh, almost coincided with the decision that I, I hadn't even really talked with anybody about to switch over to, to businesses. This person walked in, Nancy Marshall of Marshall Communications. She has the PR Maven podcast. She would be absolutely miffed with me if I didn't mention it. <laughs> it's a great podcast on uh, personal branding and PR if you're into that kind of thing. And she said, well, I want to do a podcast and we're doing it right now in house. We've done like 20 episodes and it sounds like it's in my conference room because it is in my conference room and I'm using a Blue Yeti and there's no, you know, it just doesn't sound good. And I would rather come here and record here. And so I was like, oh, oh, nice. <laughs> okay. Oh. Oh. So, so that's when it started, which was pretty much January of 2019. And we still had an aim. You know, I still wanted to help creators who couldn't afford that rate. There are a lot of uh, just creative, independent, artistic people here in Maine. I don't know if you're familiar with Portland, Maine, but it's, but it's very much that crowd. And I felt a little bit like a sellout, you know, moving from serving the little guy. And I was a little guy with a little guy podcast to serving businesses. And like, I don't have time for the little guys. And that felt really crappy. But that was part of the plan was to open up the studio that I'm sitting in right now and say, all right, well, now we're here and we have this clientele. So now people can come in and for uh, $75, they can rent this space for an hour. They get a live engineer in the, across from me as the engineering suite. That's why I'm pointing. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah. Can you pan your camera <laughs> no, for the audience? No, please don't do that. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. <laughs> no, I want to see. Look, look how nosy I am. You can see my, you can see personas running in there. So we opened this up so that you could come in here and you, for $75, that's very affordable. You get a live engineer that handles your mic and, and make sure you sound good. And then when you leave, you give us $75 and we give you very good sounding audio, which you can then go edit on your, on your own, which is an affordable middle of the road to help people get good sounding audio before they can actually afford, you know, like $150 to $200 an episode just for editing. I'm actually a little bit interested because you've talked about a transition from I'm afraid to charge anything for somebody to now being able to, at least in my mind, the way I perceive things, in my mind, you're probably a little bit bigger than life, but being able to walk into a business metaphorically and say, this is what I'm worth. What's that transition been like for you? Long? What's the conversation <laughs> in your head? <laughs> that, yeah. What was that you had with yourself when you did that? The aha moment for me was that 
And I should mention my friend Jacob Coldwell, who is a, he's a business coach. He lives here in Maine. Uh, you can find him at themountainpassway.com. He and I had had a lot of conversations as friends. Uh, I'm not I'm not a client of his about, you know, just general stuckness in life. Right? Everybody goes through it at some point, maybe before as old as I am now or maybe after. I don't know. Uh, but I was going through it just in general. I felt stuck in life with the business struggling at first to be able to find independent creatives that could pay us. It was like adding an additional this isn't working and this is so hard and why is my life always so hard, right? So I was very much in that space when this aha moment came and and it came during a conversation with Jacob where it wasn't, I'm not walking into businesses and saying, this is what I'm worth. I'm walking into businesses and saying, in order for my business to function and survive, this is what it takes. And if you're not going to pay that, then I not only will I not work with you? I cannot work with you and have it work for me. So it, it's not about finding the, it, for me, it wasn't about finding the confidence to say, we'll do your podcast editing, give you a place to uh, to come and record it, provide a live engineer, do manage your Facebook ads, launch your show, manage the uploads, do your transcriptions by hand. Like, we'll do that for 640. But the reason the price is 640 isn't because like, I'm worth 640 because my name's Tanner Campbell and I own the Portland Pod. It's because if I want the Portland Pod to ever be more than a studio inside of a co working space, this is what I have to charge. And if you don't understand that, that's okay. No hard feelings, but you can't work with me. Wow. I, I appreciate you sharing that because I think there is the perspective that maybe pricing can come from arrogance. And it sounds like that's exactly the opposite, right? Pricing came from humility and going, hey, I'm sorry. It's not that I'm uppity, but this is the business model that actually works. Yeah. And I've had to have that conversation with some people I really, really like, like professionally and personally, like I would love to be able to edit your podcast for this price, but I can't because I have business expenses because I will lose money and go out of business if I offer you this price. And then, then who, who gets help? Right. So that is, but I've never like thought about that in a grant, like, any kind of grand way. <laughs> I've never thought about like that being an actual approach, but that was a conversation between like friends almost. So I think that also plays into the relationship because if, if you're working with the business, they understand that I would, I would imagine they would understand that there's, there are numbers you have to meet and there are expectations and things. Which is another benefit to working with businesses is, is that they, they do understand that. So it makes the conversation it's not personal, it's business. And and they get it because they have budgets too. And they have things that, you know, they have to hit a certain profit margin for them, for themselves to survive. I was just thinking, you know, that plays perfectly though into the article you wrote because you've shared with our, us your perspective. I tend to think of you as a bit of a futurist, always looking forward and seeing the trends. And so when, I don't even remember who recommended that we talk about this article, but when that came up, I was really intrigued by that. I don't want to necessarily derail it, but I thought it was really interesting how that all kind of goes together. Do we want to head into that? I'm, Carrie, you're in charge, so I, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to ask permission. Yeah. I, no, I just want to give people the opportunity to speak after last <laughs> week <laughs> to kind of check myself. Well, I, it, to be fair, I was in the comments, so it's not your fault. But yeah, I, I mean, can you maybe share with us a little bit about your perspective on the potential future of, can, can I call it podcast editing as a cottage business? Is that is that effective way to call it? Sure. I mean, that that, that is kind of what we've always been up to this point, right? I, I, I feel like and this is just one person's perspective, but real money in podcasting is, again, one person's perspective. But six-figure incomes seem to be relatively new and, in my experience, seem to map with how much big money is starting to come into this medium. Because the great thing about businesses is that they have a lot of really smart people who work for them, and they really love profits, right? So in some ways, that's really bad. But they are able to see, and this happens to every art form, right? There are people who come up with it and they think it's really fun and they create in this way and they struggle as individuals practicing an art form to conceptualize the processes, framework, mechanisms that can take this thing 
that people like and that they have a passion for and turn it into a machine that makes money. But businesses know how to do that because they have data analysts and they have departments and they have all these different smart people who work for them who can figure these things out. So now that a company like Spotify that has all those things is super interested in this, it's getting a lot of attention. I think over the last three years, we've seen a lot more businesses start to be very interested in adding podcasts to their marketing stratagems. So we've got more money coming in and it's just changing everything. It's changing everything. I would definitely agree. I just want to let Simon Taylor know that we see your question. And I think it's probably best if we get to it at the end, because there's a lot of stuff I want to cover in the article. And I think some of it may actually be addressed as we talk about it. So we see you, Simon. I don't want to. <laughs> and we see you, Jacob. So we will we will definitely get uh, Tanner to answer those questions. Mm -hmm. And if you have any other questions, feel free to leave it in the comments and we'll we'll get to it as the show progresses. Yes. So, Jennifer, just make a note and um, yell at me <laughs> to get back at that. So first, I want to ask you one question, because you wrote this article with the thesis being essentially the way we as a cottage industry do our jobs and market our jobs and sell our services needs to change. You talked a lot about the freelancer. We're all snowflakes here. <laughs> so some of us are businesses. Some of us are, you know, legit businesses like yours with like staff. Some of us are using contractors and some of us are just, you know, just a one man shows. But really, who when you say freelancer, who are you really speaking about? When I say freelancer, and I think I use that term at the outset of the article, mostly in reference to web designers of the early 2000s, uh, but I would apply it to, to freelance editors as well. We are people who generally lack the infrastructure. We lack the funds. We very frequently lack the on-paper education uh, to go and get a job as an audio engineer for a big company. And we also have the mentality of, I want to work for myself. I don't want other people to tell me what to do, which, which I definitely have. I have a huge dose of that. Uh, much to my girlfriend's chagrin sometimes. There have been some tough years. <laughs> uh, but but we're people who we want to work for ourselves. We're gritty. We've got a good portfolio. We can get it done. We have the skills where it counts. But, you know, we can't. It's it's really hard to it's hard for us to find a real job, as like my dad would say, right? Go get a real job, Tanner, and stop editing podcasts in the basement. That's what a freelancer is to me. Okay. Okay. And that pretty much covers, oh, all of us, right? <laughs> okay. Let me say, I'm looking at my notes. I'm sorry. And the cat just knocked something over. So, you know, hey. Did the um, cat knock over your notes? No. <laughs> no, it's way up above the refrigerator. Anyway, go <laughs> one ahead, of, Brian. One of the things <laughs> I thought of when I read the article, because you're talking about accountability as a service. You're saying that the thing that businesses want really is to be able to trust that there's a no-touch process for them. And I don't edit for any large clients, but I know some people that do. And typically I've not heard of those being no touch because almost every time it has to go through multiple levels, like marketing has to look at it. And then when marketing's done, then legal has to look at it. And then when legal's done, sales has to look at it. And when sales is done, then marketing wants to know why all their stuff was pulled out. <laughs> <laughs> right. <Yes. laughs> there's, a, there's a level of accountability on you to not screw it all up, but then there's also the added workload and the challenge of hurting the cats when none of them report to you. Do you have any perspective on how to approach, like how we can approach that and give the businesses what they actually want without taking out the parts they actually need to do? Something that we implemented that I, I want to say was uh, over the winter, I can't remember the exact month we started doing it, but I, th I think we started doing it officially in March. We built a QA program and the whole reason we did that was because we had two clients who were in industries that are very heavily regulated. They're hamstrung by those regulations just in general, no matter like, – like you described. you got to have a board meeting and then you got to have a, a subcommittee meeting and the subcommittee meeting has to enter data into a spreadsheet in order for somebody else to approve and they have to deal with that all day. And there is no getting around that if the company is big enough, especially banks, some of which are our clients. They're going to have to do that to some extent. But when when we – talk about white glove service or when we talk about a premium experience, which is usually the language that I use when I'm pitching something, what we're saying is you will give us an expectation. We will work with you during the onboarding process to figure out what that expectation is. 
You'll tell us where we need to submit, who needs to approve, yada, yada, yada. And we will make sure that nothing we give you will not be in compliance with the things that you've asked from us so that as it goes through that very daisy-chained chain through six people before it gets approved, you are never going to kick it back to us. It's not going to be on us that something was missed or something was excluded. That, that will be in writing from you or there'll be instructions somewhere where you told us to exclude it. So our process generally is that the editor edits it, uh, the editor and engineer. Sorry, Steve. The edit, editor and engineer works on the audio, and then we kick it over to uh, somebody on our QA team that will – you guys are probably familiar with the app Edit Point. Have you heard of that app? Edit Point is, a, uh, is an app that I think is three ninety nine dollars a year, and you can load an MP3 file into it. And when you click the button, you can add a tag, and you can say what needs to be fixed. So we contracted – and then you can send that um, – you can send that text file back to your editor to say, at this point, this point, and this point, these things are wrong. So we contracted the creator of that software to build us our own internal that only we and our, and our uh, contractors or employees could use. We kick it over to our QA team, one person, only one person gets it, I mean, and they use our version of Edit Point. And that has been modified so that what it exports is a Pro Tools compliant text document that you can import markers into the session. So if there's anything wrong, our editors get that text file, they import it, and all the markers are right there in Pro Tools, and they make the changes, and then we can send it to the client. And then at that point, the client is not listening to it, right? The client is listening to it for things other than mistakes, right? We have never, since we've implemented that program, and to be honest, we implemented that program before we really implemented that program. Like I was doing that before we were paying anybody else to do it for us, before we built that proofing team. We call them proofing engineers. We have never had any of those aforementioned highly regulated clients uh, send us back any audio. And this is my contention for doing that. I remember when I started talking about this in the podcast editors group, I think it was, or, or it was a podcast editing group of some kind. There was a lot of opinion that, well, you're the editor, so you should catch the mistakes. And I was like, no, because I'm one person. And when I'm editing and I'm listening for quality, and I'm editing, and I'm listening for content, and I'm editing, and I'm listening for levels. And I, there's, I'm listening to this in three different ways, and it's an hour long, and there are three people talking. I'm going to miss something, or I'm going to spend too long on it. So I need to go through it as fast as I can, as attentively as I can, and then I need to package it up, send it to my proofer, pay the proofer $25 per episode that they proof, and if it's bad, they kick me back all the mistakes, and I fix them in five minutes, and then it's done. I think I might be getting off trail here. So if somebody wants to rein me back in, that's probably a good idea. I can add to that because I had a similar thing. Like I remember like I was doing show notes at one point, like while editing, it's like you can't do so many things. And when we're charging the rates that we are, like we need to have like a premium product. And every time like a client like sends it back saying, hey, this is a mistake that you missed. Can you fix it? Like it hurts. Like my pride is injured. So actually, I think it was around the same time that you're like talking about that in the editors club. Like I have a VA that kind of helps me keep me organized. And I started having her just give it like a once through, just kind of listen to the episode for those little mistakes. For like some of my, I guess, more high maintenance clients that have to like stop and repeat, kind of go again a lot. Just kind of like going through a once through. And ever since I started doing that, I've never had any issues with my client being, hey, why was this missed? So I think like having that quality and I don't know if it's on topic with what we're saying, but I think like for uh, for people who are doing this professionally, trying to charge a premium price, like it's important to kind of have that kind of quality assurance built into it. So I have a, a quick question. When you are working with businesses who have, you know, regulations they have to follow, you know, the, the legal department review, do you have a list of things they should not have in the podcast? Or is that is that part of the proofing process? Like if you hear something, you're like, oh, I know this is like they can't say this. Or do they give you a list of that? Or how does how does that address? We'll use the banking industry as an example. They're pretty well disciplined. The people who are hosting these shows are chosen to host these shows because they're well disciplined. They know the company line and they tow it well and they know what to and what not to say. However, 
we are very small. I don't, I don't want to convey that we have, you know, hundreds of, of clients. We have, we have like a almost two dozen clients. We're not dealing with, you know, I, I think on your last episode, somebody had over a hundred clients and I was like, whoa, that's so many clients. Wouldn't that yeah. be cool? <laughs> yeah. That's not typical, but even 24 is like a lot for most people. So, so we have a very intimate relationship with these people who come in because they come in, we see them. These are not people who send us files. You know, they're coming into our studio. And so there are conversations that happen during the during the recording process. There are check ins that happen when they get their monthly uh, when they get their monthly hour of consulting time, when we send them reports for their listening, their listening metrics. And when we send reports for how their uh, their their uh, Facebook ads are performing, when we send those reports to them, there's conversations and there's you build a very real relationship with them. And in the building of that relationship, you're also, you're learning things about their industry. You're learning things that are going on in their industry that, that really the public doesn't know about, but you become privy to because you're in the room when these conversations happen. You know, John will say to Jane something that they'll, and then they'll turn to me and say, ah, actually we can't say that. And then they'll have a conversation amongst themselves about some kind of class action that's going on. And, and if we say that it might convey this. And so you start to get this insider understanding of not just what they've told us during the onboarding process of, if you ever see us doing this, make sure we don't do that. And references to employees' last names, that's a big one, should never be included. And so if somebody slips and they don't catch it, make sure that you catch it. And so we have that list that we'll build with them, the hot sheet, we call it, the things to look out for for that client. And then and then we have, I don't know if you all are familiar with Trainual as a knowledge-based platform, but... We use that so that if we have an engineer who's working with somebody who they've never worked with before, they can pull up their trainual uh, profile and they can look at the hot sheet and they can see for things to watch out for and they can see what the all the presets are, for example, in the session so that they know where to find it and, and all that good stuff. You just build these relationships with these people and it's not like you're, a, you're not just an editor anymore being only looking out for what you're told to look out for. You start to develop this understanding of their industry and you catch things that they don't catch and that wasn't on the hot sheet. And you call them up and you say, hey, Steve, I don't know. You said this and it seems like you could do it, but did you consider this angle? And they'll say, oh, yeah, uh, we actually shouldn't say that. Or it's maybe we, we could say that, but it muddy the waters a bit on this issue. And so thank you for bringing it to our attention. And yes, you should take it out. And that's a benefit that I, that I think I have as someone who has people who come into a studio. I wouldn't have that relationship if somebody in Ohio was a client and they were just sending me files. I'm not going to build that rapport with them. And again, I've gone on for too long, <laughs> so... Yeah. No, I yeah. mean, it's just fascinating. Like, I have this it, internal it, timer that's like, you are getting <laughs> yeah. off track, dude. I'm a little bit intrigued by this because I work full time and then I edit. This is my side hustle is editing. And as part of my job, I've been through some training for lean manufacturing and a little bit of training for Six Sigma and that kind of thing. And what I know from that is that what they would call a visual inspection. So an actual human checking for multiple points of failure in one fell swoop is notoriously bad at actually catching the errors. And so it's hard for me to to think that another error wouldn't come through just because you've got somebody looking at it. And so I don't want to devalue the service because it's clearly working, but it's hard for me to go, how can you be sure you're catching them all? As an individual or as a series of individuals? Even as a series of individuals, right? Because even after the third pass, they've demonstrated that you still get high failure rates. High is still a low number, but it's more than one. So one of the ways we combat that from happening and thank you for bringing it up because it's a good point. In our contract language, there is this hot sheet that we build, which is not what, which is not what we call it in the contract. But it is like, look, you've told us to look out for these things. If something comes up that we were not told to look out for and we have no reasonable way of, of knowing that it shouldn't have been there, you cannot hold us accountable for that. Right? That's on you for not communicating it. And if we learn it then, well, okay, cool. We'll add it to the list and it won't happen again. We really don't have those issues. Everybody who works on audio here has been trained that, and I'm a little bit of a bottleneck here. I'm not particularly proud of, of this, but I have a little bit of a hard time letting go and giving engineers direct access to like C-suite executives at national banks. Like that's a really difficult, that's a really difficult reign for me to let go of because it's just a part of communication with people like that that you can't teach. 
It's you have to trust that the person can do it. And I'm just it's something I have to get over and I'm I'm not going to keep talking about that. But I do encourage people to come to me when they are unsure. And I have no problems going directly to whoever my contact is at whatever company it is and saying, look, this is in a little bit of a gray area. We think this, but we want you to take the call. Now, that does add some extra involvement to them, but it doesn't happen frequently. And generally speaking, and I cannot think of an instance where this hasn't been the case, calling them and asking, even though it's taking three minutes out of their day to run it by them, it's always providing value that is, it ends up being the right call to have made. That's good. Thank you. I'm tying this back into the accountability piece. So so really that that quality assurance is a type of accountability because you are maintaining a standard for your clients, right? What other things would you say are those accountability services that people really need to consider because it's not just it's, it's got to be more than just getting a file, editing it, going here you go and wait for the next one, right? Because I think that's really what you're talking about, is that that back and forth, that simple editing is just not going to be a thing anymore. Right. So something that all of our, well, maybe not all of, 90%, I'm making that number up, but it feels like that. 90% of our clients seem to want is they're very keen that the podcast be used to create additional content. It is not just a piece of content marketing on its own, although it is, of course, that. It is also a hundred individual pieces of content that they can use in other places to promote their brands as as they see fit. So other things that we provide in this service is by hand transcription. So it's not rev.com. It's not sonics.ai, although we have some that will not pay the extra. And so they get the automated. We use somebody here local in Maine to support the local economy. and, And this person with these people do those transcriptions for us. So When I say accountability as a service, I mean they have an expectation that their podcast work and they want somebody to hold accountable for making sure that all the tools their internal teams need to make it work are there for them. And they don't have to spend any time trying to chase you down to make sure that it's there or be uncertain about whether or not you can deliver on the quality they expect. So accountability as a service for us is you're getting audio that we've checked and double-checked and rechecked, and now you have it, and you can run it through your systems, and you can make sure that it's the way you need it to be because you have to pass it through all those filters to make sure that nothing got missed that we didn't know about. You've got something that you can base multiple article entries off of or and audiograms that you can promote. You've got artwork unique to... You've got artwork unique to the episode that you can use to promote and stick in various places. You've got... What else do we do? Of course, we take care of their Facebook ads and such. So it's almost like we're some kind of media agency at this point. Accountability as a service is, is essentially saying, I want this solution and I want all the parts that come with it because we don't know how to do this and we don't have any time for this and we want you to do it. And so you're going to do it because that's what we want. And if you're a podcast editor who's just like, well, all I do is edit the audio, then these people are going to say, okay, well, I'm not going to build a whole team of people who can do this and can do this and can do this because you can only do the editing. You should build the team. You build the team and I don't care what it costs. I'll pay it because I just want the solution. I want to hold you accountable for providing this thing that I want. And I don't care what it costs because I believe that if I pay you, it's going to come back and it's going to be what I need so that it pays for itself. Because that, And I say this in the article that that businesses are not interested in saving money. They're interested in saving time. They're interested in making a profit. And if they have to spend money, they don't care how much it is. So long as it helps them save time and gets them the result they want. So they'll, I mean, they'll pay $6,000 an episode for the right thing, right? If, if they're selling a $1 million product and $6,000 on an episode allows them to sell two of those products, they'll happily pay that. And that's another great thing about businesses is they're not paying for your time, right? Businesses don't trade time for money. They might do that with their employees, But that's not what they do with vendors that they work with. They're trading results for money. They want the result. You price the result in a way that makes you able to sustain yourself in the way that I do for my business. And they'll pay it because as long as you can deliver on it and you're not, you know, messing up every other episode and they got to send stuff back and you create a lot of friction in the relationship and everybody's unhappy and it's always a struggle. 
they'll pay whatever you ask them to if you can deliver on what they want and if they've valued what they want at something that is within the range of what you're asking them to pay. And I think that that's great. And I think that the more I think about this business as a whole and what um, businesses need and what they really need is, is more of a podcasting as part of digital content marketing strategy, which then you turn kind of your you know, a digital content agency. Right. And I think that is going to be the future for a lot of people is shifting from just the podcast editing. You know, the people who offer these kind of holistic services, they're great editors, but they're also great marketers because they've been doing this for so long. However, I think there is a whole segment because we're talking about businesses, but I think there's a whole uh, kind of niche in that, which is the solopreneurs who are making six figures with what they're doing who do have the money to pay outsourcing, maybe not $640 an episode, but maybe somewhere close to that. And did you think about that when you wrote the article or were you really just focusing on the business side? The reason that I, that I push so much to have people focus more on businesses is because with, and this goes to what Brian was saying earlier about, and I can't remember if this was on camera or not about me being kind of a futurist in a way. I look at Descript and I look at these other solutions like Descript and I look at this equipment like the Rodecaster Pro and these mics that are just, they're perfect for podcasting. I mean, it's becoming so easy to do most of it yourself by just opening up a box or spending a little bit of your own time, you know, like a two hours learning how to use Descript, that it's not that those people will stop wanting other people to do that work for them, but they will start to devalue because they will start to understand or they'll think they start to understand how quickly they could do it. And so if you could, if I could do it with Descript in five hours and Descript only costs $10 and you're a professional, you could use Descript and do it faster because Descript sounds good enough for me and I don't want you to do it better than Descript does it. And so all of a sudden, what you're doing as an editor is becoming devalued by the market and the market makes the rules. Like if they say, if they say that uh, Descript can do it for $10 and so you should do it for $25, $10 a month and you should do it for 25 and that's what they want. There's not going to be a freelance market left. It's only going to be these people who it's only going to be these creators who are like, you know what? I understand the art of this and I want to help a freelancer put food on the, on their table. And so I'm going to pay somebody a good wage and, and I'm going to make sure that I'm taking care of folks and I'm going to do it the right way. Those people, I mean, it happened in web design. It happened with blogging. I mean, it's inevitable because editing, editing is a technical skill and leaning a little bit on my experience in IT, but before I started doing all this, one of the hardest things that I had to do as a hiring manager was Finding people not who were technically competent, because you can teach that. <laughs> it's not hard to show someone how to edit a podcast in any DAW. Week of stand-up time, it's a few weeks of practice, and by month two, they're off to the races enough to competently edit a podcast. If you're engineering, but with tools like Isotope, I mean, God, it's almost taking all the it's taking almost all the guesswork out of it. You don't need to be an audio engineer to make audio sound good anymore. It's becoming easier. The hardest thing to hire for was the fact that these people who were good at IT couldn't talk to people. <laughs> they, they, they were like in a server basement and they were good at talking to the server, but they couldn't, like their customer service skill was absolutely terrible. As the market starts to devalue the skill of editing because of all these really, what will become increasingly more effective ways of cheating the process of editing, right? I mean, that's what Descript does. It cheats the human process of editing by making it much, much easier and much, much faster. And you push a button and all the levels are right. And where you drop it into whatever that thing is called online, where was it like Audible or something? I can't remember what it's called. Otter? Alphonic? Alphonic, right. Alphonic. You're just like, oh, I need the levels. I don't need to learn how to master that. Badoop, there we go. It's good. And it sounds fine to me. (laughs) So uh, as they start to devalue of an editor, they're going to need something to justify why in the world they would still pay somebody to do this when they could have these other automated systems do it more quickly. So you have to replace what the, what the cornerstone or what the primary 
pillar of your value is. It's no longer this technical thing that robots will increasingly do better. It's this communicating with people thing. It's the seeing the big picture thing. It's the helping them strategize thing. It's the helping them market thing. It's the seeing the big picture thing and helping them navigate the landscape of being successful or failing. That's where they're going to, they're going to put a premium on your expertise. That's what they're going to want because Descript can't give them that. Descript can't show them how to make a successful podcast. It can only help them edit one and make it loud enough. So do you think that in the future that businesses like yours will be the ones scooping up the freelancers to work for them as opposed to direct to clients? Yeah, that's well, I mean, that's something I've been thinking about, too. And I've been as I have been doing this for a while and in the podcast editing community, which I love to death. So please, nobody take offense to the next thing I'm going to say, because it may not seem very. And I know I tell my son, don't ever say anything where you have to qualify it. Not everybody is cut out to run business, right? And we need that. We need people who aren't cut out to run a business. So people who do run businesses can have help running businesses, right? And it's a, a lot of headache and a lot of work to run a business. So I think that to some degree, this will take a lot of pressure off of people who are freelancing now to kind of come in to these larger editing companies and have steady work, essentially. Because now the also the money's coming in. So now everybody can get paid, you know, a decent wage. And there's a large portion of people who will not have to, you know, get yelled at by the client if something goes wrong. That'll be on the business owner. <laughs> it is. So, yeah. <laughs> so that's a, you know, that's what I tell, you know, people about white labeling, label services is like, you know, I'm charging a little bit less because I'm not the one who gets yelled at if something goes wrong. <laughs> on that topic or in that vein. We had somebody reach out to us from the Philippines, probably within the last, I don't know, six months, and they were looking to edit podcasts, and they sent me some examples. This was not your previous guest. That's not why I'm smiling. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad it wasn't me, too. Just <laughs> no. <laughs> they sent me their portfolio, and it was it was pretty good. It was much better than I expected uh, from a cold reach out, right? Like, I figured this person was just brand new and edited maybe three episodes, but this person clearly was talented and was good. And so I said, okay, well, I mean, we do need somebody right now. And, you know, the business part of my brain is like, oh, I could, I could charge way less. I could pay him way less and bring my profit margins way up if I'm hiring somebody in the Philippines. And, and then my, like my moral brain was like, don't you dare, <laughs> don't you dare do that. So he sent me back a rate that was, it was not an acceptable rate. And I sat with that for a couple of days. Like it was too low is what I mean. And I sat with that for a couple of days and I was thinking, you know, and you talked a little bit about this on your last episode. There's this tension between freelancers in America and freelancers in, I hate using first world, third world countries, but de the developing markets, I guess, might be the better way to say it, where there's, you know, you can charge 50 an hour and I can't compete with that. And you're just as good as I am from a technical perspective. And the guy on your last episode had like, he had like a whole team of people. I don't have a whole team. I don't have like a hundred people working for me. I just got a few people working for me. How can I compete with that? And my solution for competing with that is teaching those people that they should be charging what I'm charging. And so when I got back to that individual and they work with us now, I said, this is not your rate. $200 an episode is your rate. And this person wrote back to me like, I can't take that much. That's so much money. And I'm like, if you work here, if you edit for us, I pay you this because it's ethically, I feel like it's just terrible for me to fatten up my profit margin at, I realize it's not at their expense. It's a living wage for them, but it also does something towards, I mean, I'm one person, this is one business. I don't think I'm going to change the world with this, but if we as, as developed, I, again, I hate making that qualification, but if we as America in comparison to the Philippines, start paying editors in the Philippines what we pay ourselves, then editors in the Philippines are going to be like, well, we're not going to work for that anymore. So it lifts them up and it solves our problem of competition that we can't really outprice. It's an excellent point. Yeah. Never really thought of it that way. Okay. So we have just a few minutes left and we have some questions coming in from Facebook that we want to take care of before it gets too late. Jacob asks, what one tip would you give to a person just starting out starting their own editing and management business that you wish someone had given you. I struggle with these things so much. Uh, 
again, I'm going to talk too much and I apologize ahead of time, Jacob. I promise I'll say something useful. Every time somebody asks me something like, what do you wish you knew so that it would have made your life easier when making whatever it is that you've done? I always think, well, but if I had known that, then I wouldn't have made that mistake. And if I didn't make that mistake, then maybe I wouldn't have, like maybe all the failures and mistakes I made are the reason that I'm here because I learned all those things. And maybe if I had just known all those things going into it, I would have taken it for granted and I wouldn't have been able to develop the grit to get to where I am. I have a hard time in general, philosophically speaking, answering this question. But that notwithstanding, I would say it took me longer than it should have to understand uh, two things as, as an editor and as somebody who produced their own content. Sorry, Steve, we're talking about <laughs> we're talking about content creation, Steve. I apologize. That's a different group. We're fine. Yeah, no, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know <laughs> he's watching. Anytime though. we can pick on Steve, right? <laughs> anytime. He's he's like a god. You have to pick on him someday. Right. It's like picking on your dad. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. He's 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 podcasting daddy. That's going to be his new nickname. It took me forever to figure out compression because it's it's a relationship and compression is once you get it. And I will actually say that that Tom, what is Tom's last name? Tom Kelly is probably responsible within the last year of me getting that last 2% of understanding compression as well as he does. It takes a long time to learn compression, and it is at the core of really making a good mix. I wish I had known Tom Kelly five years ago. How about that? That, was, that? that would be good advice. So your tip is to go watch Tom Kelly's videos on YouTube about compression and just like dig into it and then start start reading everything. Okay. Secondly... The in environment matters so much more than any of the equipment. Like when people crap on the Yeti, I'm like, listen, the reason the Yeti sucks is, first of all, it doesn't suck. It's a condenser mic. It's super sensitive. And you're in your living room. And it's going to sound terrible because your environment's not right. So go buy a $50 mic and spend the other $500 you were going to spend on acoustic treatment. And you've got yourself a good recording pre-post, right, in production. So those would be my two pieces of advice. And definitely check out Tom Kelly on YouTube. He's got a bunch of really good videos. Just uh, search for Clean Cut Audio and you'll find it. He's the sponsor of this episode. Yeah, it's Tom. Tom, where's my check, Tom? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, seriously, but you're right because that Tom Kelly was the last the last 2% for me as well. Like I really, really got it. We're lying a little bit, right? Like it wasn't 2%. <laughs> it wasn't 2%. <laughs> I'm lying too. It was like 25%. Let's call it two. Tom I feel Kelly, better with two. He, he filled in the blanks. He filled in the, it really did fill in the blanks in a way that most people, because nobody was really explaining it the way he was. And I spent a lot of time now explaining it to other people. Uh, do you know why that is? Why? Because Tom Kelly is an audio engineer and the rest of us aren't. <laughs> and so he's, he's got that mathematical scientific understanding of it to really be a good teacher. I keep, I've been talking to him for months to try to get him to start a course. And he's like, I don't know if I should do it. I'm like, you need to do it. I'm trying to get him to come talk to my ladies, my just busters. I don't know. You can't, can't see the shirt, but um, about some of this stuff. And he just is, is kind of shy about it. So uh, Tom Kelly, you're awesome, right? You are awesome. Oh yeah. I'm supposed to shh, Jennifer's telling me shush. Okay. I'm going to stop. All, All right, right. So Simon had a question about your marketing and advertising techniques, how you made the switch from working with, you know, independent creatives to, the big companies like what was your marketing and advertising techniques and what was that switch hold on let me read the rest can you put that back up just so i can read that <laughs> real quick <laughs> my question is what marketing advertising techniques did you use before the switch and what are you using now oh man okay so i know simon simon lives in new hampshire and if uh and here's his address in his social no i'm just kidding um Simon is an extremely talented artist and he makes terrific t-shirts so Simon, if you put your website link or your store link in the comments, I would really encourage people to check it out. Wildly talented and a really good kid. I don't know that I can answer this very useful in a very useful way, Simon, and I apologize. Um, Maine is Maine only has 1.3 million people in it, and it is a very. It might be one of the last vestiges of when you know somebody, you know everybody. It's it's very much that kind of state. Once we got our first business client, and it helped that she she's the biggest PR company in Maine, uh, probably in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, she connected us with a lot of people, and we don't really do a lot of advertising. However, that being said, and now I'm thinking of it as I say it, we write a lot. Right, The whole reason that I think I'm on, on this podcast is about something I wrote. I'm a big advocate of 
giving away as much as you possibly can in regards to your knowledge. I know you're an artist, but something I might suggest to you, I know you're moving over to B2B, something about covering the process of, of what you do, Simon. Maybe a live stream of art, a live stream of the process of making shirts, you know, the screen printing process. And I don't think I'm remembering this wrong, Simon. I'm pretty sure that's what you do. Showing people your competency is much better than designing an ad and running it on Facebook. So if you run an ad on Facebook, that's great. And I'm not telling you not to do that. But the content of that ad shouldn't be like $29.99 special on, a, you know, once you order a thousand, you get a break or something like that. Like that shouldn't be the ad. The ad you should run should just be like a really interesting video about the process of what you do so people can see that you know what you do. Uh, so as an example for you, I'd love to see, and I think you know some friends who could help you pull this off, Simon. I would love to see like a little one or two minute video that was an interview with you and your passion overlaid like some panning shots of like using the machines to make the shirts and stuff like that where it's really like, I love this. I'm good at this. These are the results of what I do. It's less about telling people you're great and more about just showing people your passion. That has worked really well for me. Uh, and I think I think it crosses over to almost every – I can't think of a business that it wouldn't work in. Yeah. I remember like years ago, we were talk, somebody was talking about like advertising and there was a guy who was a professional clown. He was getting like some like advertisements done. And somebody was commenting on it and his advertisement, it wasn't pictures of him as a clown because he wasn't selling himself. He put pictures of happy children that were – you know, joyful because of what he does, because he's selling that experience, not a clown. So I think that's really good advice. I would also absolutely recommend a story brand as a way of, I, I would read anything that story brand puts out. And if you can afford to become a story brand certified guide, I would do that. It's expensive and I haven't done it, but there's, there's a lot. To, they're really smart. They teach you how to tell a story, as the name might suggest, that really puts the target in this at the as the hero of that story. And another thing is copywriting. So, as an example, and this is not, and I apologize for doing this. I'm not attempting to plug my course. I, I'm trying to show off the copy. But if you go to if you go to learn.portlandpod.com and click on the editing course, I want you to read that page and know that before I wrote that page, I had a terrible page that didn't sell anything, and now it's sell. I mean, I don't want to say, say it sells like hotcakes, but it's, it's selling much better than it did. And that is because I learned how to write copy, which is way more important than you think it is. And the guy I would suggest for that is Mike Kim, and that's MikeKim.com. Uh, I think it's, or maybe it's MikeKim.co. But if you Google Mike Kim content writing, that dude gives away a lot of knowledge and absolutely check him out. Listening to Story Brand and, and taking some advice from Mike Kim would be great ways to learn how to be better marketers. To better communicate. Absolutely. The copy is so important. As a matter of fact, using Grammarly, I have started seeing more conversions than I ever did before, like more engagement, more conversions. So even something that simple and you, I've started with the free version. That's something to point out. A little typo will make people think that you just like you don't care enough to catch it. And the truth is that like, like I'm a hundred percent proofreader after I hit publish, then I find all the yeah. issues. It's, <laughs> it's really annoying. Me too. And my girlfriend will be like, oh, I read your article, this, this, and this. And I'll be like, shut up. Don't tell me that. Just let it be. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's that's why I make it. Don't let my husband read it afterwards because he'll tell me. And then I hate it. And then people, people will correct you. They'll send you. Like, don't think they won't send you your typos because they will. They will. Do we have any more questions, Daniel? We got one more from Mark. So how many of your clients are consulting clients only? Considering, as you say, people can get things done cheaper in other ways. but they still need someone to show them, get them started and be there to answer questions. I've found that to be for me. I have a few clients who I only consult for. Uh, we don't have a recurring list of clients that are consult only. We do have probably between three and five people that come through our door pre-COVID, right? And that's starting to pick up a little bit more now, uh, now that we're getting towards <laughs> what I hope is the end of it, but it's probably just the end of wave one. Uh, things are starting to pick up a little bit. You're right, Mark. The people who want to do this themselves still need to know how to do it themselves. And so they're looking for things like online courses and they're looking for things like one-on-ones. So I don't mind sharing it. We charge $130 an hour for a one-hour consult and, and then uh, every hour after that. And we get between three and five people a month will come in and they'll say, hey, we found your website. We really like the reviews. We've checked out some of your work. 
Uh, do you have any recommendations you could send us or can we meet with you? And something that I, and I might get, I might get shamed for this, but something that I still give away is I give away four 15 minute discovery calls, which could be used as mini consults uh, every week. If you go to portlandpod.com forward slash one five M I N as in 15 minutes, you can schedule for free a discovery call, which I label as a way of determining whether or not we're a good fit uh, to work together. But, but really I encourage people to use as look, if you have like three very specific questions you just need answers to, and we can wrap it up in 15 minutes. I'm happy to give you that. Again, I do four of them every week and that just goes kind of lockstep with what I said before about giving away the knowledge because they're not ready to convert yet if they're still trying to do it on their own. But, but I want to help them because if they can get to the point where they can afford me, that's great. I want to help them get there. It's another way of developing your expertise too because every time we get somebody who stops, us, stops in and consults with us, we say, hey, thanks. I hope you got the value out of it. If you feel that you did, click this link and leave us a five-star review on Google. We have, a, we have an F ton of five-star reviews on, on Google because of that. So you have a Google My Business? Oh, yeah. Oh, super important. Please have that if you don't. <laughs> Yes, Jennifer taught me how to do that. And it, it was a, a good thing that she did. Uh, super smart. So definitely everybody do that. It's super, it's simple to do. I won't give you instructions now, but it is super simple. So I guess we are uh, at the end of our time here. We only went 12 minutes over, which was great because <laughs> yes. I talk a lot and there was a lot to talk about. Tanner, I guess we didn't talk about editing the last episode either oh, yeah, that was, <laughs> at all. It was fun. Yeah, I know. I cats. I'm sorry. You're gonna, I'm they, sure you're going to write like another today. profound article that we can talk about. So. No pressure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, Tanner, like he, what is it? Every, every two weeks that you put out an article or uh, every month? I'm <laughs> lately I'm drawn between like writing more philosophical moral pieces that I keep on a separate publication uh, and, and writing stuff because everything that's going on right now, it's hard to stay out of the fray to some extent. Uh, but yeah, I think I've released a, a piece or two since then. Uh, anybody who wants to check it out, it's medium.com forward slash Portland pod. Uh, I think the latest article is like my just general good advice for people who are looking to, to grow their podcasts. So I think it's a pretty good one. Awesome. And we'll be sure to put links to that. Everything you mentioned to Mike, Kim, everything will be in the show notes. You can find that at podcast editors, mastermind.com. Tanner. Thank you so much for coming and talking to us about this article. I hope this is just the beginning of other conversations like this. Thank you for also giving us insight into your business, which is very fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like I've learned a lot just being able to pick your brain. So I don't know about these guys, but we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. So, Brian. Do you want to tell people how to oh, get on man. the show? I would love, I would love to do that. So if, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, I think I might be a great guest for the podcast editors mastermind. Maybe you have some questions that you'd like to bring to have us help you think through that. And maybe have the help, people in the chat help you think through that. Or if you've got some topic about podcast editing or the business of podcast editing that you'd like to bring so that we can discuss that and we can all grow together as a group, visit podcasteditorsmastermind.com and you'll find a form there where you can let us know that you're interested. And we'd love to reach out to you and see if we can get you on the schedule. We, we do have a people that have already reached out to us, but we're always wanting to get more people because we do have to get people scheduled at a time that works for them and our publishing schedule. So we'd love to hear from you and see if we can get you on the show. If you're interested in helping grow your portfolio, this is also one way that you can do that because you get the opportunity to edit an episode that was recorded like this, and then you get the opportunity to get a shout out when we share who who edited that episode and potentially something that you can use as your portfolio, maybe a referral from us, that kind of thing. So all of that stuff, podcasteditorsmastermind.com. Back to you, Carrie. Thank you so much for that. Brian. Silliness, right? <laughs> yeah. And thank you so much, Tanner. Thank you for to our audience for joining us today. Really appreciate you guys hanging out and, and your great questions. That was awesome. So I guess that's it for us. Do you want to let everybody know, Tanner, where they can find you one more time? Sure. Uh, you can find me at PortlandPod.com. You can email me, Tanner, at PortlandPod.com. And if you want to take advantage of any of those 15-minute uh little mini consults, portlandpod.com forward slash one five M I N as in minute uh, and, and book one. 
happy to talk with you. Give you some ideas, maybe answer some questions. I'm Daniel Abendroth, and you can find me at rothmedia.audio. I'm Brian Inspring. You can find me at toptieraudio.com and Top Tier Audio on most social channels. And our lovely producer today has been Jennifer Longworth of Bourbon Barrel Podcasting. I... <laughs> You can find her at bourbonbarrelpodcasting.com. I am Carrie Caulfield. Eric, you can find me at yayapodcasting.com. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the podcast, editorsmastermind.com. And we will see you in a couple weeks. Uh, um, so, how much is that? Um, I, um, uh, um, 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 um. And that's a wrap. Thank you for listening. This episode was edited by Alejandro Ramirez from Daya Podcasting. See you the next week.